Young people are losing faith in democracy. What a surprise. Power has been taken out of the hands of ordinary people for many, many years by many, many governments and sucked up to the very top. Most people rightly feel that they don't have any influence over the major decisions that affect their lives. Too often, our society seems like it's more like an oligarchy than a democracy. A place where billionaires, big businesses and media moguls can lobotomize politicians to get every whim that they have turned into policy. The people in positions of power throughout our society simply don't care about the voices of ordinary people. They are quite content to run the country as they have been for centuries, not paying any attention to the lives of the people over whom they govern. We've seen this with the way that they've treated the allegations against them made over the Partygate scandal. We've seen the way that Rishi Sunak thinks that he's able to be Chancellor of the Exchequer whilst having a green card and being on track to becoming an American citizen and with a wife who is a non-dom, who is not paying tax in the UK. The conservative attitude towards democracy is really one in which they hold the people in some level of contempt, whilst also trying to manipulate people, trying to manipulate the media in order to ensure that they're able to hold on to power. So we've just seen a study that has shown that young British adults have lost faith in democracy. Now, the headlines about this are all about the way that the right of the Tory party has undermined democracy by doing things like proroguing parliament, not taking parliamentary convention seriously. And those things are obviously important and do feed into this problem, but this actually dates back much, much longer. One of the ways that we can measure people's enthusiasm about democracy is by looking at statistics around turnout. And if you look at voter turnout in elections across the last kind of several decades, you see a really significant trend starting in 1997, because after that point, working class voters drop out of the electorate at every election. More and more working class people just decide it's not worth voting. Why is that? Well, there's a pretty obvious cause here. It's that parties of the left that were supposed to represent working people decided that it wasn't really up to them to represent the working classes anymore. And as they did that, more and more people looked to our political leaders, looked to the people who were supposed to represent them and saw people who were out of touch, people who really didn't listen to their concerns and who just really took their votes for granted. And that kind of response of what has Labour ever done for me is something that you see up and down the country and particularly in those red wall seats that Labour has lost. And it's something that's repeated over and over again by young people who don't see their views on climate, on housing, on inequality represented anywhere in the political spectrum. And the one brief moment when they were, there was this onslaught from the media designed to completely destroy the person who was promoting those ideas. So all of these questions about democracy, they are a little bit about institutions, but much, much more than that. They are about a corrosion in our political discourse. They are about the destruction of the link between political parties and the people that they are supposed to represent. And they are about the complete exclusion of many, many people's voices, views, opinions, ideas from political debate. The report also mentioned that one of the reasons people have lost trust in democracy is that they see private interests as being able to really strongly influence policy through things like political donations and lobbying. The ironic thing is, is that up until recently, we had a mass political party, one of the first in several decades, that was funded entirely by the contributions of the hundreds of thousands of people who signed up to be part of that movement. The fact that they were so worried about ordinary people being able to influence the policy process more than lobbying groups, vested interests and private businesses shows that this stuff is really important and shapes what happens within politics more broadly. We saw this over the course of the pandemic when several very senior business leaders were able to have conversations with senior politicians to lobby for support for their businesses. And the reason that they were able to do this was because they had the ears of the politicians who were making the decisions. The idea that those politicians would have to listen to ordinary people rather than just big businesses and actually the people that they went to school and university with is something that the establishment simply won't tolerate. What the establishment was really worried about when Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party wasn't actually Corbyn himself. It was the movement that he championed and represented. They were worried about the fact that Jeremy Corbyn was accountable to ordinary people, that there are actually, there was a point in British history where the average person who was engaged in a social movement or the Labour movement would be able to influence what was going on within the Labour Party and therefore within the British state. That is not something that has ever really happened before because working people have been really shut out 
from most of the institutions of the state throughout most of its history. There was obviously a brief period after the Second World War when the labor movement had a more significant role in shaping state policy, but then with the neoliberal revolution, even that avenue was shut down. The whole neoliberal shift that took place in our politics, first pushed by Thatcher and then taken on enthusiastically by politicians like Tony Blair, involved really isolating a lot of institutions of the state from any democratic accountability. It involved giving independence to the Bank of England, to creating very technocratic ways of organizing society, to outsourcing, which took a lot of public services out of the democratic sphere and placed them in the hands of private corporations. And now, over the last few years, we've seen these same politicians say to the electorate over the vote to leave the European Union, not, we understand why you feel as though you haven't benefited from integration with Europe or why you feel as though politicians haven't listened to you, but actually you were wrong to vote in this way and often just you're stupid, which is something that a sentiment that has been reinforced by many of these liberal politicians when speaking to voters who voted to leave the European Union. There's no attempt to actually engage with the way in which liberalism has created the crisis in which we find ourselves by eclipsing alternatives to the status quo. People want change. They know that things aren't working the way they are. They want to be able to see real substantive transformation of society. And liberals, by kind of foreclosing any alternatives to the way things work right now, have actually forced people to adopting very kind of extreme positions that advocate a big significant change in society, but generally one that aligns with the interests of the far right. And this is a lesson that we have to take from history, is that given the choice between deep-rooted socialist transformation of our society that would create general prosperity, that would save the environment, and that would make everyone better off, or fascism that would protect capital, liberals will always side with the latter. Keir Starmer is by no means immune from any of these criticisms. If you remember the point immediately after when Jeremy Corbyn was elected, the mainstream media was just ablaze with coverage of how he was going to do kind of Stalinist purges against people on the right of the Labour Party. And Corbyn actually ended up being very conciliatory to uh, other elements of the party who didn't agree with him and who made his life very, very difficult. Now we have Keir Starmer, who is actively pursuing a campaign of trying to crush the left, a purge if we've ever seen it. We're seeing tons and tons of amazing activists being pushed out of the Labour Party, many more leaving in disgust, and there is absolutely no coverage of this in the mainstream media whatsoever. Completely gone are concerns about Stalinist purges when they are actually being prosecuted by Sir Keir Starmer himself against hundreds of thousands of extremely passionate members who joined the Labour Party in order to fight for a better society. So Keir Starmer's self-image and the image that he puts out to the media as this just fair lawyer who kind of stands above the fray is absolutely not true. But we aren't getting that picture because the media just doesn't want to cover the fact that Keir Starmer is basically on a mission to destroy the left. Why is that? Because the mainstream media wants to see the left destroyed too. One thing that the left and socialists don't struggle with is convincing people that their policies are good. The vast majority of people want to see things like public broadband. They want to see the railways nationalized. They want to see massive action on climate breakdown. They want to see measures taken to reduce inequality. They want higher taxes on the rich. They want more redistribution. All of these policies are incredibly popular as polls have repeatedly shown over and over and over again. So why are the people who put these policies forward consistently vilified by the media? Well, of course, it's because the people in power are deeply threatened by those policies, even though they're popular among the vast majority of people. Ever since we've had a real functioning democracy where everyone has been able to vote, the ruling classes have used a number of different strategies to try and disperse working people and prevent them from coming together and presenting a coherent and collective voice that might actually challenge the institutions that underpin the status quo. At the moment, the most powerful tool they have at their disposal is a media that is largely devoid of left-wing voices and that is controlled by the powerful. Now, I, as someone who frequently goes on the media, I'm well aware of the challenges that left-wingers face when we do this, which is why it's so important as well to make sure we're building up alternative media that can project our message out to the vast majority of people who, when that is presented favorably, do actually agree with it. 
The people in positions of power in our society do not care about you. They do not care about the struggles that are being faced by working people. That's why we have to make them care. We need to rebuild democracy from the ground up. Politicians and those at the top of society are not going to do it for us. The most powerful weapon that the powerful have is making us believe that change is not possible. As long as we don't think that things could be any different. It doesn't matter how many amazing policies we have or how many protests we have, the powerful will always be able to dominate discussion because as soon as we bring a challenge forward, they'll just say, well, that's impossible. Nice in theory, doesn't work in practice. We need to get out there and start showing that our ideas work in practice. That means engaging with communities and starting to build alternatives to capitalism at the grassroots. It means working within the labor movement to bring democracy to those institutions and to challenge bosses in the workplace. We're even seeing these tactics work in the United States, the center of the capitalist world system, where workers at Starbucks and Amazon are after a long, long struggle on the ground, finally successfully organizing to hold their employers to account. If they can do it, so can we. The media is culpable in the war against democracy that's taking place in this country and deliberately exclude critical issues from discussion and from coverage. That's why it's so important that we support institutions like Double Down News that bring us fresh content, different insights. So make sure you support Double Down News on Patreon.